Welcome, everyone, to the Sports Writers Podcast. I'm Bill Newell with MSO News Sports, joined by Phil Stacy, Salem News, Matt Williams, Salem News, and, of course, Nick Giannino from the Salem News as well. All here, we are talking football this week, among other things. Uh, but first up, we'll go to the Super Bowls. we got some Thanksgiving talk to uh, follow up on as well. But, Phil, you uh, broke a story on Monday on your Twitter account uh, with a, a, a upcoming change in, uh, as a football coach at uh, Maskinomic. Is uh, Gavin Monocle stepping down? Yeah, Gavin Monocle stepping down after nine seasons. Um, he, I just happened to be the one who tweeted it. He he let uh, the three of us know he was stepping down. That's, that's Gavin in a nutshell for you. Real classy guy. Um, we'll miss him. Tough year this year for the Chieftains. They, they finished two and eight. Um, so he's not going out, uh, you know, the way most coaches would like to, but he's had a good run. He's coached 20 years as a head coach. He was 11 years at Dom Savio before, um, he took over at Maskinomit when Jimmy Pugh left, um, set some good teams there. Um, you know, he still works in the school system, so I'm sure he'll still interact with a lot of the student athletes he sees and all. And like I said, good, good guy. Um, I would think that this job would attract a lot of candidates. It's a very uh, popular position. Uh, Tritown school, uh, Tritown area, I should say, produces a lot of really good players. I think the key is trying to keep as many of those guys in-house as you can, which is not always easy. Uh, but if you can get a lot of those guys to stay, there's the propensity to turn out some really good teams there. And uh, they always seem to have size. They always seem to have athletes. You know, this year was a blip in the schedule, in the season, but – for the most part, I think this is a uh, a pretty good spot to be in if you're coaching public school football in these parts. So I would expect a lot of candidates to uh, show interest in the Chieftain's position. Right. A lot of good uh, participation numbers in uh, Masco as well for all sports. Uh, so uh, you're right. All that all, all adds up to uh, a very attractive position, which uh, soon will be open for sure at Mask and Amit. Uh Bill, let's go to the Super Bowls as well here. We got St. John's Prep in Division One getting underway on Wednesday night against yep. Severian, 8 o'clock at Gillette Stadium. The first, uh, the, actually the second of just two Super Bowls on Wednesday. The other two days have three games in a day. Uh, and, of course, we have Salem and Amesbury from the North Shore and those other Super Bowls. We'll get to those in a moment. But um, it's the Prep coming off the loss to uh, Zavarian. Not sure... Uh, you know, I don't think they're happy about it, but they know they have a second shot at uh, at um, at Severian here on uh, Wednesday night. Yeah, um, Nick, you, I can talk, and then maybe you can talk about that game or vice versa. Of yeah, yeah, whatever you want to do. I want to start with the Thanksgiving, and then we can. Yeah, yeah. To... Start sure. with, uh, Nick was at the Thanksgiving Day game, and then I went to practice today, so we can talk about those too. Sure. Yeah, I mean, not too often you get to face the the team you're going to play in the Super Bowl a week earlier on Thanksgiving, right? So it was an interesting one for for those two teams, and um, you know, we we talked about it last week. I think the motivation was there for both teams to go and get this one on Thanksgiving. It's a rivalry game. Catholic Conference title was up for grabs, and um, regardless of the fact that they're playing for the Super Bowl a week later, I, I think it was very clear from both sides that they, uh, you know, gave it their all out there. It was a physical game back and forth. Um, you know, maybe some of the play calling was a little bit more conservative than usual. Um, they, they, they surely, both sides surely left a few things, um, you know, out there that, that they'll probably may, may use in the Super Bowl. Um, and I know in terms of players, the most team, uh, both teams, played most of their starters, if not all their starters. It just was, you know, a question of whether or not uh, those starters would get all the key snaps. You know, you look at a guy like Cam LaGrasso, the running back, uh, starting running back for St. John's Prep. I think he only had four carries. You know, they gave most of the work to um, Quigley. Is it Jeff Quigley? I believe is his name. Yes. Uh, and, he yeah. had a, and he had yeah. a nice day for them. Uh, you know, they were able to move the chains. They, they put up points. They, they ended up with 21 points. And Obviously, it came down to a game-winning field goal for Zavarian that ended up giving them the 23-21 win. But, um, you know, it was anyone's game. And, and like I said, I thought uh, very competitive. You could tell that these are two premier teams, you know, probably the two best teams in the state, and they're going to face off in the Division One Super Bowl for that reason. Um, but, yeah, I, I thought it was a great battle, and it might look a little differently, you know, at Gillette this third, this Wednesday night. Um, just in terms of the play calling and in terms of some of the guys that are seeing the bulk of the carries, seeing the bulk of the, you know, the looks uh, through the passing game and whatnot. But 
both starting quarterbacks played, uh, both played well. You know, Deacon Robillard for St. John's Prep had, I think he had all three touchdowns. Yeah, he did. Threw yeah, for two, one and ran for two others. There you go. Um, Thank you, Fantastics. Yeah, yeah. Phil had him on his uh, fantasy squad that we did there. So <laughs> that was a good pick. And then the other quarterback, uh, you know, Matt Hasselbeck's kid, Henry Hasselbeck for Zavarian, had himself a great day as well. I was very impressed with him. You know, stats didn't jump off the page, but he had a really uh, clutch drive to to get in position to kick that game-winning field goal and actually took a blow to the face. He was all bloody after the game. The coach said he, he had broke his nose. So I don't know if that's going to play any role. I'm sure he's, he's still going to suit up this week. Um, you know, he had the tissues up there, you know, handling it. I don't know if they snapped it back into place or what, but he's a tough kid and um, drove him down the field on that last last possession, had a big 15-yard run to get him into that field goal position, and that's when he uh, he went out with the, the nose injury. But expect him to play. Expect everyone on the prep to play in, in the finale. And, Phil, we can um, jump to that now, uh, what you kind of expect uh, in the Super Bowl compared to what we saw on Thanksgiving. Yeah, it's interesting you're talking about Hasselback, Nick. I mean, he's a kid who just recently committed to Michigan State. So, I mean, pretty sure he's going to play in the Super Bowl uh, on Wednesday. He's not going to sit that out. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's a guy that uh, St. John's prep coach uh, Brian St. Pierre said, you really have to account for because he can hurt you with his legs. And he did hurt the prep with his legs. Uh, you saw there was some broken plays where he uh, – had to scramble and was able to get out of some trouble and make plays with his feet, either uh, running the ball or, or making big pass plays to get downfield yardage for his team. Um, I know you had mentioned um, the running back that they have, uh, which was uh, Mike O'Connor, who went for, what, two or three, you said? But yeah. they could be getting uh, – I know that one of his backfield mates is also dangerous, Denzel – Denzel, excuse me, Pierre, could be coming back from injury. I know even um, Charlie Camella from the the great Camella lineage that's gone through is a very much like the Hasselbeck lineage that's gone through there. He's going to Boston College. He's been out for a while with a collarbone injury, um, but he's looking to, to come back and play this game. Whether or not he'll be able to or whether it'll be limited snaps, I'm not sure, but uh, the prep is going to be ready for everything. When, when I talk to the players today, um, you know, they're they're not saying that uh, Thanksgiving was a be all end all, but they, they took it seriously. They wanted to win. Um, I, I think they felt as though, Hey, we're playing them again. Um, you know, so while we'd like to win and, and win the Catholic conference title to ourselves and extend our state winning streak to 19 games in a row, all those things would have been great. It didn't work out, you know, good back and forth game. They lost give credit to Zavarian, but now they realize, okay, this is it. There's no second chances. Uh, we need to play better. Um, I think you can expect them to really lean on the run a lot more. I, I know you mentioned that uh, Cam Lagrasher only had four carries. Jimmy Nardoni didn't have any. And that BFT package, they love to run in the short yardage situations. So wouldn't they? Neither did um, did Alberti. They just well, he's been injured. Back, so he's been injured he's since okay. um, Catholic Memorial. Yeah, he's out for the year. Oh well, I miss that. So, but um, you know, they're certainly gonna you know. The grass is going to run the ball 20 plus times. Not only is going to run the ball anywhere from eight to 12 times, including all the short yardage stuff. Um, they pride themselves on their running game. They pride themselves on their physicality up front. Uh, you know, Jack D. Filippo, Braden Hughes, Alex C. and C. Russo, uh, Wells Gillette, Graham Roberts, um, Mason McSweeney, Josh Harriman, Will Kent, all those guys up front. They count on them not only to to hold the line and open those holes and provide Deacon Robillard with the pass protection he needs, but you know they're going to have to do a better job at picking up blitzes. It seems like they had a little bit of difficulty picking up up some of Zavarian's blitzes the other day. They need to be able to read those situations and and pick up those blitzes so the pass game can work in conjunction with the run game. The run game is only as effective as the prep can keep teams honest by throwing the ball. And Robillard has thrown for over twelve hundred yards. Uh, you know, and he has pass catches to throw to the ball to. We've seen Gavin Gold step up big lately. Jack Angelopoulos has got, made some nice catches down the stretch of the season here. Uh, Mason McSweeney's a big target out there. Sophomore Pierce Scala, uh, Pearson Scala, I'm sorry, is, is a big ball catcher out there as well. So a lot of offensive weapons for the prep, but they just need to have the time to make the plays and for their guys up front to make the reads necessary. Defensively, it's, it's all about containment. 
Um, I think they realize that they gave up far too many rushing yards on Thanksgiving. They need to keep that in check and do whatever they can to keep Hasselback from creating something out of nothing when the pocket breaks down. And it was the big plays too. You don't see that, you know, prep let up a lot of those explosive no, plays and that, that running back O'Connor had a few, I think he had one for maybe 35 yards, another one over 50 yards. Uh, so they got to limit that for sure, but they've seen him now. So they, they know what to expect <laughs> with him. Well, and you know, in their um, state quarterfinal win over BC high. Yeah. They won going away by 22 points or whatever it was, but they did give up quite a few big passing plays in that game. And they gave up a lot of passing yards. So if Hasselback is on his game and can find receivers, that could be problematic for St. John's too. They need to be wary of that as well. All right. Um, go ahead, Matt. Yeah, I'm sorry. Well, I just look at the Nardoni factor as the biggest factor. I mean, I don't know how you can discount that. That's how they beat Catholic Memorial. That's how they won a lot of their games, and they chose not to use it. And, you know, I don't know if that's a thing where – Maybe if you face it twice, you have a better chance of stopping it. I mean, obviously, it's on film. There's not going to be any secrets that way, but it's so unique. Um, you know, like the Eagles do with Jalen Hurts, like maybe actually playing against it would make it more equitable to defend. I, I don't know, but I, I just look at that and say that's that's the game right there. Um, that's been such a big part of their success, and they didn't employ it, and they almost won anyway. And the number yeah. of times that they choose to go for two with that package, right? They lose by two points, yeah. kick the extra point three times. Obviously, when Saint chooses to go for two, he's not knocking his kicker. Langdon Laws is one of the best around. He just feels like nobody can stop Nardone. So, you know, had they gone for two, then they're not even in position to lose on the field goal at the end, right? So I think that package really changes everything about this game. And I do, uh, I do wonder, you know, Willie, if um you know, Brian said something after the state semifinal win over Andover, Brian St. Pierre, about how not only doesn't leave the field. I mean, he's, uh, I should say, offensively on special teams. Like, they score, he rushes in the two-point conversion, and then he's running downfield on the special teams. So I think there were times maybe gets tired, he gets a little banged up. That's why they used Edwin, Edwin Castro in that game, where he scored twice on those same short yardage uh, big package situations. Maybe they sat him out for, you know, give him a breather, or as you said, not to give Zavarian that look. I mean, what they're doing is not a big secret. They run three basic plays with maybe three, four, three different, you know, options out of each play. So there's nine total. It's like playing the old Madden. You know, there's only so many options they give you out of that package. It's just which one are you going to try to sell out on as a defense and, and stop? And NFL blitz. You guys uh, play yeah. That one? Almost every, you know, uh, chance a defense makes, it's not the right call. Um, so, yeah, he'll it's be kind of interesting. I, I felt like, you know, the narrative of trying and leaving it all out there on Thanksgiving and, and you know, obviously, you know, I, I'm sure the kids that were out there played really hard, but I, I just think that's a pretty big tool to prep left in their toolbox, right? And, and I'm not talking them to say that. I just think in the analysis of the rematch, like that, you know, you add that, to the prep and obviously I haven't watched all of Zavarian's 13 games. Maybe they have something that they held back too, but that just seems like a huge thing that the prep is going to be able to bring out uh, that Zavarian doesn't have, you know, something similar that it held back to add. I, I think the addition of that really tilts the scales to, to the prep from where I'm sitting. Yeah. Well, I'm going to jump to another Super Bowl here. Interestingly enough, when the prep game ends, the next game at Gillette Stadium will be the Salem Witches versus Fairhaven. 15 Haven hours later. Day. Yeah. 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 Yep, yep, three, yep. 3 p.m. the next day, Thursday afternoon, Salem and Fairhaven. So you got Sa Salem number three seed, Fairhaven number eight. And uh, what do you guys, what's your take on this one here? Uh, Salem taking care of business as Fairhaven did on in their Thanksgiving game as well. Well, from uh, what I've been able to look at on film, very just quick kind of cursory look online, and from what uh, I spoke with Matt Bouchard about following their Thanksgiving Day win over Beverly, um, Fairhaven runs kind of like a triple option, like the old Navy veer offense, which can be difficult to defend because not many schools at all run that anymore. This isn't a spread. This is a, uh, a fullback-based offense where – they just want to ram it down your throat and try to use misdirection and, and trickery to get you 
uh, away from the ball carrier, draw your the defender's eyes away from where the ball is actually going. Um, so if when you add that deception along with a really good line and a powerful back, um, that can cause problems. And you can see why uh, Fairhaven has won 11 games in a row. Um, they also won their Thanksgiving Day game. Uh, it seems like they played just about all their size, although I don't think their quarterback um, started their game. But running that uh, that flex bone that they do behind um, Justin Marquise, who's a junior, and uh, Matt Bouchard told me I believe he's getting Division One looks. Um, he's got something like 1,700 yards this year. He had 226 yards and five touchdowns uh, in their game against Hudson that got them to the Super Bowl. Um, they got another back who went for over 140 in that same game, Josh Vieira. Um, yes. You know, they're going to run all kinds of stuff at Salem that, uh, you know, that defense is going to have to find a way to contain. You don't want to get that that zone and speed option out, uh, you know, where they can cause damage. I think Salem is a little more quick hitter offense, or, or that's what they've um, relied on this season, that those big plays, 443 yards, school record for points for them. Um, you know, it was Quinn Rock or Ryan the other day against Beverly. Uh, some great uh, catches among his five, 127 yards, pair of touchdowns. Corey Grimes with the two touchdown passes. Uh, uh, three touchdown passes, excuse me, also hit Albert Pujols for a three-yarder. Shane Field ran very well out of the backfield. He had a touchdown uh, along with 90 yards rushing and a pick six. Um, Devontae Azuna, a slow day by his standards offensively, but we certainly know what he can do. He's explosive both running the ball and catching the ball. This has all the makings of a great game on Thursday afternoon. And for Salem, it's their first Super Bowl game in 24 years, first one for Fairhaven in 23. So somebody – and their uh, town is going to be really happy at the end of that game on Thursday afternoon with another Super Bowl title coming their way. Anything yeah, I think Phil, Phil summed it up great. Um, I just think back to, to the beginning of the season where we saw Salem win a couple games, you know, to open up and we're saying, wow, this this team is pretty impressive, you know, and then we see them go toe-to-toe with a Division One or a Division Two PBD team. Um, you see them beat, you know, some other great teams in the NEC. And we're saying this this is a this is a witch's team that can probably get to the division six Super Bowl. And here we are, you know, a couple months later, and, and that's where they are. So um they want this thing. They've been working for it as a group since they were probably in seventh grade. You know, a lot of these kids have played together since the youth football level and uh terrific season, whatever happens for them. You know, it's been fun to cover them, it's been fun to watch them. They'll mention a lot of the explosive players they have and the talent on both sides of the ball. So rightfully earned their spot in this uh, championship clash. And I think, you know, with the opponent they're going up against in Fairhaven, yeah, it's it's going to be a good one. Yeah, people are excited too. And that's a good, you know, the city's alive. They're having a big pep rally Wednesday night. Uh, you know, the, there's a lot of school spirit involved. Uh, you know, it's just that this is something that when a big city like Salem – get some success like this for the first time in a while, you know, they have a lot of fun with this kind of stuff. And, and I don't think that, um, you know, there, there's not too many things like football. I mean, you know, basketball to some degree will produce this sort of stuff and, and hockey, but uh, you know, these sort of big events where the whole city is, is behind the kids and, and, you know, the kids are almost like little mini celebrities. I mean, it, it's really uh, heartening to see uh, Salem get to enjoy this kind of stuff, you know, especially with the journey that, most of these kids have been through, you know, they, they took their lumps. Uh, certainly they, a lot of them started right away as ninth graders and, and took a while to grow and, and certainly have broken the mold and set a whole new tradition there for Salem. So uh, it, it's just been great to sort of watch the story develop and, and see all the support uh, uh, that, that this crew has gotten from their city. You know, I, I think it's, again, it's just something that you don't always see in other sports or other schools or other cities. You know, you have that combination of a place the size of Salem with the pride of Salem and, and you know, having been so many years since this has happened, uh, you know, it, it sort of maybe has gone under the radar, but like, this is a huge deal, right? It's a really, really big deal and it's being treated as such. And it's been awesome to see. It's interesting where you have the two almost diametrically opposed uh, schools where for St. John's, this is their fourth Super Bowl in the last five postseasons. You know, if we throw out that, 2020 uh, COVID year, uh, they expect to get here. This is old hat. It's business as usual up on the prep campus. Whereas Salem, 
you know, this is cause for celebration, as it should be, as you said. I mean, first time in 24 years uh, where the program was not that long ago, you know, losing year after losing year after losing year. And now, as we've said many times in this podcast, they're two points shy of a perfect season. They're going for a Super Bowl. The whole city is behind them. Uh, It's great to see. Uh, Really remarkable. And in fact, (laughs) I got to say at the Thanksgiving Day football game, there were Beverly people coming up to me and saying, you know what? I'm like really happy for Salem and never, ever in my life have I ever heard that before. (laughs) Um, No, really. It's, you know, you just don't hear it when it's a notch rival like that. Uh, but but I think people will like, hey, you know what? I hope Salem wins, and that's great for them. It's great for the NEC, and da da da. So th- there's a good feeling around this team. And and these guys are great athletes too. I mean, they have some outstanding athletes on this Salem yeah. High football team. And uh, y- y- you know, they're, obviously they're they're going to be going against a, a very solid team uh, on uh, on Thursday afternoon. But uh, if, if I can just um, give a little sneak peek here, and I know he won't blow his own horn, but Matt Williams uh, wrote a great piece that will be coming out uh, prior to the Super Bowl about um, the Salem program under Matt Bouchard and how, you know, they went through all these tough times and now they've come out of it on the other end and how, um, you know, sometimes the grass isn't always greener. You have to kind of stay the course and persevere to get uh, to, you know, where you'd ultimately like to be. I I thought it's an excellent read and I'm uh, thinking our, our readers will really enjoy it too. Yeah, it's and it's great to see them have this success. Uh, really strong coaching staff. Matt Bouchard's done a great job there for years. Uh, you know, do, running the right program there, and uh, so it's good luck to them on a Thursday. How about one other game here from the North Shore? I know you guys don't see Amesbury all that much. Um, I don't either. Uh, Amesbury, the number six seed, taking on number one Uxbridge in D seven. That's Friday afternoon at three at Gillette, but uh, they, they've got a tough road ahead. But uh, speaking of running teams, as we were just a moment ago, I don't know if Amesbury has one more, one more in them uh, in this, in their run postseason run. You wonder well, another game where they all played their starters, right? I mean, you know, yeah. Thanksgiving, uh, great hundredth game up there and they went all out yeah. and, you know, got caught by a really, really good new report team. But I think if anything, it's just going to make them hungrier. I mean, I don't know the first thing about Uxbridge, but uh I know that the small school people all year have been telling me, watch out for Amesbury, watch out for Amesbury. You know, I know after their after their second round win, I think they, they might have beaten the one seed or a seed that was higher than them. And and that coach, I remember reading in the write up, said, Yeah, that team's gonna be going to Gillette. You know, no disrespect to their semifinal opponent, but that's how good they are. So uh good for them. You know, Coach McQueen drills drills the um you know, the, um, the phone booth offense there, they, they run super tight splits. I mean, they, they make, uh, they make Stoneham's offense looks like it's a spread with, with the splits that they run <laughs> it's so tight. So, uh, you know, again, similar to what Phil was saying about the triple option, it's just really, really difficult to defend. You literally never see it. Um, you know, those Uxbridge guys are going to have their hands full, uh, just designing a scout team to, to try to get a look at that thing. If I had to guess, I mean, again, for all I know, Uxbridge might run it too. I don't know nothing about them, but um, <laughs> you know, I'm guessing they don't. One thing uh, I do know about Uxbridge is I believe they're the highest scoring team in the state. Yeah. I want to say they've scored like 497 points or something crazy, and they're only giving up about 10 points a game. So, you know, for Amesbury to go and beat a, a team that's undefeated. Um, obviously an offensive machine and, and defensively pretty stingy. What a year that would cap for them. Um, you know, just, just, just a quick note, Phil Uck, Uxbridge in their uh, three playoff games scored 48 points, 33 points, 37 points. So, uh, okay. So that's what 118 points. It's about an average of 40 per game. What did Amesbury get against Newburyport on Thanksgiving? That was a high-scoring game. I just don't know. They were in the twenties, uh, and Newburyport 26. was in the forties. I think it was forty-four twenty-six was the final. Yeah, yeah that's okay. Right. What I so thought was be cool about that game is, um, you know, Willie, we had seen one of our referee friends at the uh, officials' banquet last Monday, and he said he was doing that game, and they were dressing up in the old-time gear and all. And I made a point to look at the New Report news on Friday, and yeah, you could see the officials dressed up. And that old time garb and all, it was, it was pretty cool. And, and, you know, the players for both teams had uh, old time uniforms too. And that added some festivities. Uh, I should say that added some more festiveness to the event. 
Colin McQueen would want me to note that they too have scored quite a few points in the postseason. Oh yeah. 48, 34, and 44. How about that? 48, oh, 34, so they've actually and 44. scored them then. It's well pretty close, right? I mean, no, uh, that's 30... like 130 points, isn't it? Yeah. Well, in it? the three games. Yeah. Yeah. Just to be, yeah. Well, close to 130, 120, 130, <laughs> somewhere in there. Yeah. We can move yeah. on, though. We don't need right. to nail it down exactly here. That's available out on the internet for the folks to uh, add up themselves at home. But, uh, all right, gentlemen, how about some Thanksgiving reflections at all on any other games? We saw Marblehead, uh, Swamp Scott game, great football game, it appeared, uh, with Marblehead coming out on top. Um, the Ambers winning over Gloucester, and, of course, uh, Peabody won. Matt was at the Peabody Saugus game. Um, I don't know if any other thoughts on any of the T-Day games or any of the notes out of there. So who won this um, this um this competition you guys had this past week, the rotisserie league. Uh, that was me. I had a pretty Fantasy. good day. Uh, thanks to Owen Gastonowski's five touchdowns, he helped me oh. out quite a bit. A few other. That guys. was a good. That was a very good pick. Yeah, that was that wasn't too bad. Um, had a couple other guys scored three touchdowns between rushing and throwing. Uh, two quarterbacks, Deacon Roblod for St. John's and Corey Grimes of Salem. Um, I got a shutout from the Hamilton Winham defense, plus a couple sacks and a fumble recovery. So that helped me there. Uh, but it was fun. You know, it was something different. We, I think I was waiting to, it was like waiting to get like my car inspected or something, Willie. And I called you back in like October and I said, Hey, I got this idea. And he and I kind of batted it around a little bit and we brought Nick in on it. And we all kind of agreed like, yeah, maybe this will work. And, you know, we, we played around with the parameters and how to try to get as many teams involved and players as we could. So um tell tell yeah. the story about the uh the Salem player there that was, was not, oh, yeah. happy with, not yeah, being that chosen. Was great. Um so I knew we must have hit on something because well I, I should say to, to anybody who didn't see it beforehand, one of the rules we set was that you couldn't pick more than one player per team. So say like a, a team like Peabody, you know, it's got a lot of good players on it. Only three players and or a defense could be selected. So that means that there were going to be some good players that weren't taken. Um, we didn't want to load up on some teams and leave out other teams in our coverage area. We wanted to try to get as many teams involved as we could. So that was that. That's because you guys are so fair. I mean, you guys are good, yeah, solid we're, guys. You know, you're fair. We're you know, super this, guys. This is who you, you know, guys like, are. And it yeah. shows, yeah. And shout out to that PBDD, by the way. 25 points for me. I think they uh, – 27, but who's counting? Oh, I, I guess I added it wrong. What, they have five picks? Uh, you didn't <laughs> give yourself two for the blocked punt. Ah, the blocked punt. That was the one. Okay. Yeah, so they had themselves a day. So we all <laughs> gave ourselves uh, our team's names, Bill. There was uh, – the Nahant Seagulls was Willie. And you can explain that, Willie, if you want. Uh, there were Nino's Nighthawks for Nick G and Nino. And I just – I'm not as smart as these guys to come up with something clever. So I just used a play off of my own first name. I called it the PH Fantastics, the Fantastic, like the Phillies or whatever, you know. So prior to uh, Beverly Salem, when I was at last Thursday, I'm on the field before the game, and I'm talking to some of the Salem coaches. And I hear them yelling, hey, undrafted, let's go. Or undrafted, you know, blah, 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 this, that, the other thing. And I'm like, what the hell? Undrafted? <laughs> and they said, "Yeah, we've been calling uh, Quinn Rocco Ryan undrafted. He he was uh, bummed out. He wasn't taken in your fantasy drafts." And then, of course, you know it was all a joke or whatever. But Quinn goes out and has a great game. You know how many points would he have had, Willie? Let me think. That's uh, five, six is eleven. Twenty three points he would have had, right? Five catches, hundred twenty seven yards, and two touchdowns. Uh, something Not like bad. that. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, so and somebody would have had a nice uh, day, but. There you go. We we I took Corey Grimes as a quarterback from Salem. Uh, Nick took Avant Devante as Zuna, and Willie. Would you take the Salem defense? Yeah, I figured they get. I figured Quinn would score on a kick return or a punt return, so I figured I'd hedge my bets there. You know, in yeah. case Post was the one. You know, I figured they'd get a couple uh, the kick returns, but uh, you know, the, the that's what you get when you when you hedge your bets. Uh, you know, it often comes up snake eyes, I guess. Yeah, hey, you know, stuff happens. So, 
Uh, no, we got a lot of great feedback on it from uh, coaches and players and fans and whatnot. It was a lot of fun. So I think we'll uh, – the plan right now is to make it a regular part of our Thanksgiving uh, pregame stuff. It was. I mean, it was fun for you guys. I got about 70 points, a whole bunch of zeros. I didn't think it was very much fun. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, it's all in fun, man. It gets people talking. It's – it's nice to win or it's nice to do well, I should say, but it's all in fun. You know, we, we no, got to, uh, before we go, we, we got to give a shout out to uh, Bryce Phillip Rivers Lehman. I mean, what a story. Oh, you talk about a yeah. tailor made Thanksgiving tale. You know, the kid messes up his knee and the win over Marblehead. Everyone remembers that iconic photo of him, you know, holding up his crutches after, uh, after Fenwick upsets Marblehead and, and you yeah. think that's going to be his last time in pads. And, and, you know, obviously, uh, first game of the year, mind you. Right. right. If you feel like yeah. a chance to, to talk to Coach Woods about it, he, he can maybe share some more of the stories. But, you know, they, they let him wear his pads for Thanksgiving, you know, a little brace on his knee thinking, you know, maybe he can take a snap or two, throw a pass or two. And, you know, he ends up going for over 100 yards and a touchdown as he starts feeling better and better. So, uh, you know, that, that, that final kind of pass of his high school career is yeah. all about to me. That was awesome. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. He touched down to his fellow captain, Curtis Brutch, on the final play of his career. That's uh, that's pretty awesome right there. And, you know, he was essentially in what uh, Woodsy said was a cast. Dave Woods, uh, you know, he just – they got the okay the night before. His parents were okay with it. They th- figured they'd throw him out, as Willie said, for a play or two. Maybe he hands the ball off. They're watching him in warm-ups. He looks like he's a little bit more mobile than they thought. They figured, okay, maybe he'll throw like a little hitch or something. He ends up playing the first two series of the game. Then they throw him back out there in the fourth quarter, and he – Throws that touchdown pass. I mean, a really, really great story. And he ended up getting the Player of the Year award, the Sal Tripoli Award, uh, as the MVP of the game for his efforts. So, yeah, you're right, Willie. That is a uh, – that's a Thanksgiving story. That's a story about giving thanks right there without sounding corny. Um, and, and what a scenario for Fenwick to do it in. I mean, craziest football season I can ever recall for one team for Fenwick. And um, to end that way on such a positive note I thought was great for them. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Totally. I mean, we'll be interested to see uh, what happens next year. You know, as we know, Fenwick and uh, Masco agreed to a two year series and this was year two. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have to keep our eyes open and, and see if the series is renewed or if, you know, certain leagues have other ideas or, you know, w- w- what's going to happen. I mean, I, I thought it, uh, I had a chance to be a really good rivalry so far. It's one to one. And Obviously, as as we mentioned, Masco is going to be looking for a new head coach. So uh, a lot of moving parts there to, to sort of see what's going to happen next year for those two teams. You do wonder if um, Masco would be looking to get a conference opponent, if that's at all possible. You hear rumors about uh, Fenwick and St. Mary's going to play again on Thanksgiving, which seems like a natural rivalry. Um, you know, it was ended a few years ago because of some nonsense that went on, but maybe, uh, you know, that's dissipated a little bit and they can get back to playing because they would play sometimes on Thanksgiving Eve, if you remember. Right. Um, yeah. And, or, you know, uh, sometimes on the day of or whatnot, but yeah, I think there's a lot of moving parts there, Willie, and it'd be interesting to see how that shakes out. Maybe Everett's available. I think they might be right. Well, they got uh, St. Mary's. Did play I don't know if what they, you know, this was the first year of that rivalry. I don't know if they signed a two year. I, I don't know how binding those, uh, those quote unquote contracts are anyway. I, I think uh, it was just one. Some... I think it was, I think it was just one year at St. Mary's and Everett. I, I, that's what I think. But I'm and Matt Masco sure. played Everett for a year at that. That's Fenway what I was saying. Park. Yeah. Masco yeah. played, yeah, yeah. Masco played four before, times, I think. Um, okay. Four? I thought it was twice. Okay. It might have been. I, I feel like it was more. I could be mistaken. Because then they play Malden Catholic as well. Fenwick did. Uh, yes. Um, so there's been some musical opponents out there. That, that's the thing. There's kind of a kind of an odd number of teams that seem to be looking for games that have local ties. So you, you just hope you can kind of match everybody up uh, so that nobody's left out in the cold. I mean, that, that's the most important thing, um, you know, and, and that's sort of where the, you know, the, the, the 400 pound gorilla in the room is Everett, right? Nobody, nobody really wants to play them. I was at a Thanksgiving uh, uh, thing with my wife's family and, you know, we were talking about the games and there's a, a fellow that's heavily involved in, in things over at St. Mary's and he's asking me about the game and he says, Everett, huh? Uh, aren't they a few weight classes above St. Mary's? Said, yeah. Yep. They are. Yeah, so, like- <laughs> you know, that's, that's sort of the, uh, 
Well, what's St. Mary's? Put, a Division yeah. five school? Division six for football? Six. Six for football. Seven Super Bowl. Or was it six? I don't even know. They're, but... they're in, they were in six this year. They were in six. Yeah, yeah so that would yeah. be, you know, if you use boxing parlance, that would be like a flyweight punching up against the heavyweight. With... Hey, but St. Mary's made the playoffs and Everett didn't. So. Yeah, well, right. That's, right, that's yeah. the other part of it. <laughs> <That's>... So uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, means anything exactly. to you guys out there but uh you know no, and you know i mean i think in a year or two saint mary's is going to be really good i mean their best players i thought this year when i saw them play fenwick were underclassmen um and you know a sean gristle coach team is going to get better um you know yeah. give it the more time he has with them and all uh but yeah playing everett is a no-win situation for them yeah i mean and that's that's sort of the issue is whoever you know <laughs> If you move some teams around, there's you know, there's it's gonna be musical chairs and you know, some when the music stops, right? Somebody's gonna be stuck with the Crimson Tide. And so I think there's a little trepidation about moving some things around because nobody wants to be that team left standing with no chair. Yeah, because there's really I mean, if you think about it, think about the locked in Thanksgiving Day rivalries you have. I mean, you got Beverly Salem, you got English Classical, you got Marblehead Swampska, you got Damas Gloucester, and I mean anybody else is kind of like you know, uh, Hamilton and Mips, which I suppose, um, you know, locally in Newburyport, Amesbury and things like that. But yeah. um, aside from that, you know, anything else is up for grabs. Preps are Well, well yeah, I don't I think, think anybody from the NEC is going to be playing the prep anytime soon. No. Well, no. well, our music our music is pretty well stopped here as well. And uh, I guess we still have are in our chairs here. So that's good for all of us here. So uh, <laughs> good. that's good. Nice. But uh but great work, guys. And uh, we'll did you, you have guys. a good Thanksgiving, Bill? We should just ask you. We we, we never think to be. We're sometimes uh, not always asking you the question. So, how was your Thanksgiving? Oh, it was very good. I was uh, out of town actually on Thanksgiving, and uh, but at, with family, so that was nice. I had my daughter, so uh, and her family, oh, nice. so uh, so we had a nice time. Yeah, uh, very nice. Well, these so, two guys, uh, as always, did a fantastic job making yeah. sure everything was taken care of. On Thanksgiving, uh, it's our busiest day of the year, and these guys cranked it out and did a really uh, nice job along with some correspondence. We had a different game. So uh, thanks to everyone who helped make it another successful Turkey Day for us at the newspaper. And we will talk again soon. <laughs>